before I formally introduce our first speaker, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items with you. First, I want to let you know that we are recording this conference, so it will be available um, posted on our website, um, usually within a week. Secondly, you will see a chat icon at the bottom of your screen on a bar. If you click on that chat icon, um, it will open up the box and you can um, use that chat box to type your questions and comments for the speakers. Um, there will be a 10 minute Q&A um, after each uh, presenter's um, talk. And finally, to optimize your experience with this webinar, please ensure that you adjust your speaker volume both on your uh, computer as well as your actual speaker so that you can hear the webinar well. Also, I would like to bring attention uh, that our Super Walk is back in person this year, beginning the weekend of September 10th and 11th. Uh, registration is now open on our website, so please gather your teammates, register, and start fundraising. Now, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Melissa McKenzie, who will be presenting on postural hypotension in Parkinson's disease. Dr. McKenzie is a movement disorder specialist at Pacific Parkinson Research Center Movement Disorder Clinic at the University of British Columbia. She has years of experience helping Parkinson's patients. Prior to her position at PPRC, she did medical school in Toronto, neurology residency at UBC, and two years of fellowship specializing in movement disorders at UBC and London, UK. Uh, Dr. McKenzie, welcome and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I will pass it over to you now. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me put up my slides here. Good. All right. So what I'm going to be talking about today is postural hypotension in Parkinson's disease. So what will we be talking about? First, we're going to talk a little bit about what this actually is, uh, how this might present, what sort of symptoms people can have with this, uh, a little bit of about why this happens, uh, and then management strategies about how to manage this uh, if you do have symptoms with this. So a definition, postural hypotension or orthostatic hypotension are actually the same thing. Um, they're both referring to a drop in blood pressure that can happen when someone changes position. So that can be from lying to sitting, sitting to standing, or uh, lying to standing. So typically we measure the blood pressure first, either lying or sitting, and then after one to three minutes uh, later in the standing position, we're measuring the blood pressure again. So a normal response after having this sort of position change the systolic blood pressure, or that first number for the blood pressure, doesn't change at all. And the diastolic blood pressure, which is the second number, actually might increase by up to 10 points, and our heart rate can increase as well. When we stand, there's actually about half a liter to a liter of blood that begins to pool in our legs and in our abdomen. So what needs to happen is the blood vessels need to constrict to be able to return more blood to the heart and get more blood to the brain. The cardiac output also increases. So the blood vessels sort of distally in the body are trying to constrict and then the heart is pumping a little bit harder and the rate can increase a little bit as well. All of that is to increase the blood flow and ensure that the brain is getting the blood flow that it needs. So an abnormal response or what we might call orthostatic hypotension, the systolic blood pressure, that first number can drop 20 points or more. The diastolic or the second number can drop 10 points or more. So for example, if someone is sitting down and has a blood pressure of 140 on 90, they stand up and their blood pressure goes to 120 on 80, that would be postural or orthostatic hypotension, so a drop in the pressure. What sort of symptoms might people have with this? So the most common thing we hear is, I feel dizzy when I stand up. 
Um, but it's not always dizziness. Some people can feel this a little bit differently. So people can feel dizzy. Some people might feel a little bit lightheaded. Some people may just have this sense of fatigue when they change position, just a little bit tired. Um, some people can get some blurred vision. Remember, all of these symptoms are from not enough blood getting to the brain. And so uh, some people can experience that as a visual symptom. Some people just feel a little bit of weakness. So they change position maybe a bit too quickly and they just feel generally weak. But if they stay up on their feet, actually they start feeling better again. Some people can get a bit of a headache with this drop in blood pressure that might go away when the blood pressure normalizes. Some people just feel a little bit fuzzy, right? Their thinking just doesn't feel as sharp uh, when, if they change position too quickly. Now, a big one that I, that I always screen for in the clinic is falls. So if people are standing up and their blood pressure is dropping, Sometimes that can actually lead to completely losing consciousness, so a syncopal event, or sometimes because of sort of feeling lightheaded and the vision's off, people can have a fall, and they might be more likely to fall when they've just changed position, so it's less of a balance issue, it can actually be a blood pressure issue. And importantly, people can actually be asymptomatic with this. So maybe your doctor measures your blood pressure in different positions. There's a drop that would meet criteria for uh, postural hypotension, but the, you don't have any symptoms. And so that's quite common as well. So what do we think maybe kind of normal blood pressure changes? You know, standing up really quickly from bed, especially first thing in the morning, that happens to a lot of us. Um, bending over really quickly to, you know, grab something from the floor or a low shelf and standing quickly from that, you know, you feel a bit woozy for a second. That's probably normal. In terms of what causes orthostatic hypertension, why does this blood pressure drop happen? So we think of this as an inadequate response from the nervous system, that's our autonomic nervous system or the automatic nervous system to blood to positional change. As we mentioned, there's all these changes in the blood vessels in the heart that need to happen to keep uh, the blood pressure, the blood flowing to the brain and to fight against gravity. Uh, as we've sort of alluded to and talked about, the symptoms are really from not enough blood going to the brain. This can be made worse by dehydration. So if you don't have enough sort of circulating blood volume, there's not enough for the body to redirect to the brain and it can make symptoms worse. And dehydration can come with not enough fluid and not enough salt. Both of those contribute to our, our blood volume. Postprandial, so after a meal, uh, our body redirects some of our blood flow and to aid in digestion. So because of that, there's less of the blood sort of available to be redirected to the brain. Parkinson's disease itself can cause orthostatic hypotension or a blood pressure drop. And of course, that's why we're talking about this today. We'll get into uh, the whys a little bit more uh, later. Uh, and Parkinson's medication, including our mainstay of treatment, levodopa, can drop the blood pressure as well. Uh, and this is what I hear a lot in the clinic. My blood pressure used to be high, but now my doctor says my numbers are great. So a lot of people may, when they were younger, have actually needed a blood pressure lowering medication or sometimes more than one. And after some years with Parkinson's, uh, their numbers when they're sitting in the doctor's office now look really great. Uh, but actually, maybe that the blood pressure might be a little bit artificially low at this point. So triggers, this kind of plays off what we were just talking about. So early morning or, or the middle of the night. So as we lie down in bed, our, our blood kind of redistributes again because of gravity. Um, and so in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning, we might be getting up a bit quickly to rush uh, to the bathroom and that blood pressure can drop because there's not enough time for the blood to be redirected to the brain. So I often ask people in clinic, 
Are you feeling steady on your feet if you're up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night? Um, and that can sometimes cause falls, you know, in the bathroom or, or coming back to bed kind of a, a few minutes after standing. After a meal, as we mentioned, the blood flow is redirected. This is particularly worse with big meals. Um, so uh, with a lot of carbohydrates, for example, uh, the blood flow is redirected. This can happen after alcohol as well. So it's again because of changes in how the blood is flowing. So alcohol works to dilate or widen the blood vessels towards the skin. That's kind of redirecting some of the blood there and there's less blood volume available to be going up to the brain. In hot weather or hot water, the same thing happens similar to alcohol. The blood vessels at the skin dilate uh, to allow us to kind of cool down and to sweat. Um, and so hot weather or hot water can be a trigger for blood pressure drops. Um, as we've alluded to after some years with Parkinson's, uh, there can be blood pressure changes after starting or increasing Parkinson's medication as well. So let's get into the, the nitty gritty here. Parkinson's disease and blood pressure changes. So as we get older, there's actually a lot of people that can have a bit of a blood pressure drop when they stand. So if we look at kind of an aging population, somewhere between five and 30% may have a blood pressure drop when changing position. Um, and this is sort of without Parkinson's disease. When we compare that to a Parkinson's population, that number increases for somewhere between 40 to 60% of people. So when we compare to age match controls, this is more common in Parkinson's than people of a similar age. About half uh, of people who have this with Parkinson's are symptomatic. And of course that means about half of people are asymptomatic. So they wouldn't actually know that they have this unless they test for it. Um, we think of this actually as part of the Parkinson's disease process. It does come up as a non-motor symptom of Parkinson's. And of course that's why we're discussing it today. Interestingly, there's been some work done to show that Lewy bodies, that's the protein that accumulates in the brain and in the gut, uh, as part of Parkinson's can be involved in some of the changes to the autonomic or automatic nervous system. The peripheral autonomic nervous system also has changes, so that's uh, the areas that are supposed to be constricting in response to position change. Um, so they can be affected and they can be less effective at doing that. There's also decreased sympathetic innervation of the heart after years with Parkinson's. So sympathetic innervation, that's our fight or flight response. So those are the nerves and the, the kind of the chemicals that are working to increase our blood pressure, heart rate, and cardiac output. Uh, so if there's less of that, then again, it's harder to mount what needs to, the response that needs to happen to get enough blood flow to the brain. So how do we actually measure this? Um, this can be measured at home if you have a blood pressure machine or of course in a doctor's office. Um, to do an initial reading for blood pressure, we know we get the most accurate readings if people sit or lie quietly for about five minutes prior to the reading being taken. Um, ideally, we like the blood pressure taken again for accuracy with the arm around the heart level. So if you're sitting down, that might mean having your arm up on a table or up on uh, kind of the edge of the couch, that kind of thing. Um, that gives us the most accurate readings. Uh, no talking during this. This is, I think, is the hardest thing when I do this in clinic. Uh, we shouldn't be talking during this or it can raise the blood pressure. Uh, so take the, the reading either sitting or lying. Keep the blood pressure cuff on your arm and stand for somewhere in the range of one to three minutes. Everyone can be a little bit different. If people have symptoms when they change position, I'll recommend that they take the blood pressure reading again, um, kind of at 
the time that they have symptoms. Um, the blood pressure reading, reading gets repeated, and again, ideally with the arm around heart level, although it has to be relaxed, so you can't hold your arm up in the air, otherwise that's not an accurate reading, um, but having a friend or family member help, or maybe putting your arm on kind of the back of the couch or on a higher counter um, can help put it in the right position, similar to what your doctor may do if you were in the clinic. Uh, and then both measurements should be recorded um, so that we can see if there's a change between those two measurements. If you were to measure your blood pressure all throughout the day and night, there are changes from moment to moment, depending on kind of what you're doing and, and other factors. And so it needs to really be a change between the two positions that we're looking at. Uh, and if, of course, recording any symptoms that you have as well. These blood pressure logs can be reviewed kind of with your family doctor, uh, with your cardiologist if you have one, uh, or with your neurologist. This actually can be quite easy to miss. And the reason why is it's not found if we just test the blood pressure in one position. So at your doctor's office or at home, a lot of people just monitor the blood pressure when they're sitting down. And so that number might look normal, uh, but actually we don't know if there's a blood pressure change on changing position until we monitor kind of sitting or lying and then standing one to three minutes later. This also interestingly isn't seen on a 24 hour blood pressure assessment. So I've had some people in clinics say, oh, well, my blood pressure must be fine. I just had a 24 hour monitor and they're quite happy with the numbers. Again, the blood pressure changes uh, through the day depending on what activities and that we're doing. And we don't know if there's a drop between positions unless we test for it, which isn't done on a 24 hour monitor. Um, a lot of your, your other physicians, your family doctor or your cardiologist might be familiar with these sorts of numbers to say, you know, is the blood pressure normal or is it elevated? And these are our uh, targets in terms of preventing long-term bad outcomes with things like uh, stroke and uh, heart attack. But this really isn't the whole story in Parkinson's. So if someone has a, a sitting blood pressure of, you know, 135 or 140, in someone else that might be a number that, that your doctor wants to treat. But before we ever think about treating that in Parkinson's, what I really want to know from the neurology side of things is what happens with the position change. Because if that number drops 20 or 30 points, it might not be safe to treat a blood pressure that's slightly elevated when someone's sitting. Um, you know, your, your doctor or your family doctor might be much happier with your sitting blood pressure numbers, but then if you come to your neurology appointment, and you're having all these symptoms, you don't feel good when you stand up or you're having falls or all these things, it might actually be more dangerous to be treating that sitting number um, because of the drop that can happen. So what do we do about this? So if, if someone's actually having symptoms of feeling dizzy or any of those other things we mentioned, the easiest thing, of course, is to sit back down. That will sort of make people feel better generally, um, and it's, it's sort of allowing more blood to go to the brain. If that's not enough, then it can be helpful to lie down flat. Again, that's even easier for the blood flow to work against gravity. Um, and even more than that is actually lying down and putting your feet in the air. And again, that's gravity helping kind of get the blood flow back to the heart and therefore back to the brain. In terms of preventing this from happening, so most people do this already without thinking too much about it. You know, if you're if you've been lying down sitting before you stand up or if you've been lying in the recliner sitting before standing up can limit uh, the symptoms with this or or make them go away. Sometimes people can find it helpful if they're lying in bed in the morning and if they have a, a lot of symptoms when they first get up to actually do a little bit of exercise in either a lying or a seated position. So this might include kind of moving the arms and legs, doing some muscle tightening exercises. 
sort of squeezing the muscles to get, again, the blood flow moving from those limbs. Uh, of course, avoiding provoking factors like we talked about, um, you know, big meals or alcohol or really hot water, all these kinds of things. Uh, not all these factors can be avoided necessarily, um, but avoiding them when possible if you know that it's something that triggers your symptoms can be helpful. Um, some people also find it helpful actually to sleep with the head of the bed up a little bit. So um, this kind of gives you a bit of a boost on gravity for when you're getting up in the morning and can limit the amount of symptoms uh, with the blood pressure dropping when first getting up in the morning. So another way that we might treat this is to review the number of blood pressure medications uh, that you're on, uh, the ones that are working to lower the blood pressure, if you're on any of those, or to look at the dose. Obviously, we should be kind of taking readings and reviewing this, usually with your family doctor or cardiologist, about whether about kind of how to make safe changes. Um, we may need to lower the dose. We may need to stop some of these entirely. Um, generally best done after kind of having these recordings, right, for your doctor to review, because oftentimes if I might sort of document a drop in the clinic, people go into their family doc and they take a seated blood pressure and it looks really great, so no one wants to make changes. So I usually mention in my consult note and, and recommend to people to do some of these orthostatic readings in different positions uh, to review those. If, if someone's on sort of three medicines to lower their blood pressure, obviously this can take some time to find out kind of the safest level of these medications to be on going forward. Um, and this needs to be reevaluated. So if Parkinson's is, is new and early, people might still need medicines to lower their blood pressure, um, but that might change in five or 10 or 15 years. Um, and the blood pressure may be dropping and these medicines may need to be reevaluated. There are other than blood pressure lowering medications, there are other medicines that someone might be on for other reasons that can also lower the blood pressure. So for example, commonly medicines that people are on for BPH or, or for the prostate uh, can lower the blood pressure. It can certainly be, you know, we need to balance the risks and the benefits of being on a medicine like this because some people need to be on the medicine uh, for the prostate. And even if it does lower their blood pressure a bit, it might still be worthwhile to be on those medicines. Uh, medicines that treat erectile dysfunction are all, often um, can lower the blood pressure as well, again, because they're redirecting uh, and sort of changing the blood flow, um, so that can lead to symptoms. Um, some of the older antidepressants can, can lower the blood pressure as well, although I don't tend to have too many issues with these meds. Uh, for people and rarely some some rare more rarely used diabetes medications can also lower the blood pressure a little bit. Other treatment so making sure we're getting in enough fluid during the day so this can be really hard um, and we see here there's sort of different uh, recommendations based on kind of average body sizes uh, for men and for women. Um, it's, it's something often that we need to kind of work at in terms of getting enough fluid to help with the avoiding blood pressure drops. Um, I actually have some people I follow that they might have a, a glass of water uh, and sometimes their, their first dose of medication before they get out of bed in the morning. We know that sort of 10 to 15 minutes after taking, uh, you know, 300 to 500 uh, milliliters of water, we can actually have a, an increase in the blood pressure by about 10 to 15 points. So if people are really symptomatic in the morning, that can be quite helpful to actually start with some water right away. Um, it, this doesn't have to just be water, this can be uh, other uh, fluids as well, although obviously some of the other things are, are much higher in, in sugar, um, but they do count technically towards uh, our total fluid intake. Interestingly, caffeine can be helpful as well, so something like tea or coffee. Um, this can help because of the fluid, but probably caffeine helps raise the blood pressure a little bit as well. Um, so this counts towards fluid and, and may help itself uh, separately. 
Uh, things like soup uh, obviously count towards fluid intake, so that can be helpful. Um, and then most of us get about close to 20% of our fluid intake during the day from actually high content veggies such as say cucumber, tomatoes, zucchini, uh, or fruits. So things like you know, apples, mangoes, pineapple, watermelon, all these kinds of things that have a fair amount of fluid in them, um, which again is, is why it can be difficult to track how much fluid you're getting in a day, uh, but having a snack with those might be helpful as well. So if we work on increasing the fluid, what will that actually do? This will usually work to decrease the amount that the blood pressure drops when changing position. So if you're having symptoms from a blood pressure drop, of course, this can improve those symptoms. So lightheadedness, fatigue, headaches, etc. Some of these things respond to having an increase in fluid. It can also lessen constipation. So this is a big one in Parkinson's. We know that uh, constipation is often made worse by not taking in enough fluid. Um, a lot of the, the strategies we might recommend for constipation actually depend on fluid as well. So my number one recommendation for constipation is usually PEG, polyethylene glycol. That's uh, the stuff that's in Restorlax or Laxidae, and that actually works by pulling fluid into the gut. So if you're dehydrated and don't have sort of extra blood volume circulating, medicines or supplements like that won't actually help much to work on constipation either. Uh, it can actually help drooling. So in Parkinson's, some people have, have some amount of drooling from not swallowing enough, kind of the automatic motor movement of swallowing um, isn't as common. So sometimes carrying around a water bottle and taking small sips throughout the day helps with the fluid intake, but can also lessen the amount of drooling people are happening, having. Uh, it's not all uh, roses and puppies though. Of course, if you take in more water, this uh, more water, uh, more fluid, uh, more trips to the bathroom, of course, and, and this can be a struggle to find a good balance. Um, uh, of course, urinary symptoms quite common in Parkinson's as well, and we'll be hearing more about uh, that later today, so which is uh, good timing. Uh, another treatment that we look at is salt. So um, the fluid that you take in is important, uh, but salt, we can think of it as kind of helping the fluid stick around. So home cooked food is generally relatively low in salt. Um, not that I'm recommending, you know, eating all your meals out or, or eating pre-made food, but we know that people who generally are eating mostly home cooked food, their diet's relatively low in salt. Um, this is the recommended sort of sodium intake per day for um, helping with the blood pressure. Again, these things are, are quite difficult to measure though. So usually I'm sort of recommending people try to increase their salts intake without a specific target to measure. Adding more salt to food can be one way, uh, but again, that's, that's not much in terms of sort of daily salt intake. Um, sometimes adding a salty drink can be helpful. So I have some people I follow that may have a cup of V8 first thing in the morning, uh, make a hot cup of chicken brovel in the winter, uh, or have a bowl of soup. And all of those can be helpful, both from the fluid, but also particularly for the salt. Uh, try adding salty foods. So my favorite thing in the clinic when I can tell people they can have doctor recommended potato chips uh, or other salty foods, uh, but these can help uh, as well for daily salt intake. Uh, and salt supplementation seems to help. So this is a treatment done in younger people who have syncope or loss of consciousness. This isn't in a Parkinson's population, but I do still think it's interesting. So some of these people have, this is to pre-syncope. So as time goes on and they're on kind of a, a tilt table, more and more patients are having kind of these pre-syncopal symptoms or symptoms of the blood pressure dropping. Uh, for patients who had sort of extra salt supplementation, this is much delayed. And there's not many people who started having symptoms until kind of the 20 or the 30 minute mark, at which point they're actually putting people's lower body in negative pressure to even worsen kind of the blood pressure changes that might happen. 
And interestingly, with this population who did not have any high blood pressure at baseline, but when they looked at salt supplementation over a couple of months, it didn't have meaningful increases uh, to things like heart rate or blood pressure. That So it wasn't worsening people's baseline readings, but it was helping to limit the drop that happens when people change position. Um, so that's quite interesting. Compression is another symptom, uh, another treatment that can help uh, with blood pressure drops. So we have compression on the legs here, or this is an abdominal binder here. Again, sort of having less blood pooling in the legs or abdomen can help have more blood to go to the brain. Uh, I have to say, I don't often find myself recommending this to people, um, particularly the, the, these are really hard to wear. It can be hard enough to put on socks and shoes and Parkinson's to put on these really tight stockings. Um, I often find is somewhat more trouble than they're worth, but it is a potential treatment. Now, treatment, looking at Parkinson's medication, most of our medicines that we use for Parkinson's can have some effect of lowering the blood pressure and causing that drop with changing position. So I always like to review kind of are we sure that we need these medications if there are medicines in particular that might be less effective for Parkinson's symptoms? Um, you know, do we still need them if they're potentially causing a blood pressure drop? Uh, so a common medication that can cause a blood pressure drop are dopamine agonists. Um, and probably these are a little bit worse at causing blood pressure drops compared to levodopa, which unfortunately is also on this list. Um, so Sometimes uh, we might be limited with how much we can increase levodopa or how quickly because of blood pressure side effects. Um, MAOB inhibitors, so this would be medicines like rosagiline or selegiline, not used as much anymore. But if people are having blood pressure problems, these are sort of weaker medicines in terms of helping with Parkinson's symptoms. And so I would wanna reevaluate whether they're needed. Uh, medications like amantadine, so people might be on these to help with dyskinesias or extra movements, uh, can sometimes worsen blood pressure changes. Uh, a newer medicine that I, I don't have so many people on, so apomorphine used generally to treat kind of unexpected offs in Parkinson's, can have blood pressure side effects. Um, duodopa, this is the intestinal gel form of levodopa, so like levodopa, it can also have blood pressure side effects. These are some other meds that sometimes people with Parkinson's might end up on. They can actually have some benefit towards blood pressure changes. So these aren't medicines I would use to treat blood pressure changes. But for example, domperidone is a medicine that helps uh, move the gut. Uh, and so if people have nausea with meals or with their levodopa doses, they might go on this medicine. And coincidentally, it might also help with some of the blood pressure drops that someone might be experiencing. Fluoxetine is an SSRI. That's a medicine for depression or anxiety. It may be helpful in, in blood pressure, limiting blood pressure changes as well. Uh, and certainly I wouldn't be recommending deep brain stimulation or the surgery for Parkinson's because of blood pressure issues. Uh, but for people who get uh, DBS, particularly the target in the STN, subthalamic nucleus, sometimes some of the studies have shown that this may limit um, uh, orthostatic hypotension, uh, although the research is somewhat mixed about this. And then, of course, there are actual, sometimes, medicines that we use to limit the blood pressure drop. So let's say we've done all the other things. We've worked on increasing fluid, increasing salt, decreasing antihypertensive medicines, uh, kind of being smart about how we're using the Parkinson's medicines. But some people are still symptomatic, and this can be having a huge impact on people's quality of life. Uh, so one of those medicines is fludrocortisone or Florinef. This is typically given kind of as a, a 0.1 milligram or sometimes a, a double dose uh, per day. Another one is midodrine. Uh, the dose of this can vary uh, and some this can be given kind of two or up to three times a day. 
Often I dose these medicines if we're using them with the dose of levodopa, um, both to make taking pills easier, but also because it's, you know, when the levodopa kicks in, that may be when people's symptoms are worse. So it's more effective to have something on board to be increasing the blood pressure to counteract some of the effects of the other medicines. Um, Flornaf works by expanding blood volume. So it increases sodium absorption from the kidneys. This allows more water to be reabsorbed um, and uh, works to increase the blood volume, which of course we know now increased blood volume means more blood available to go to the brain, uh, which can help with, with orthostatic hypotension. Side effects for this medication include sometimes low potassium, and some people can have edema or swelling in the legs. Uh, and so sometimes we might need to, to stop or lower this medication because of that side effect. And I wouldn't necessarily start this medicine in someone who already has some swelling in the legs. Midodrine works a little bit differently. So we learned earlier that when we stand, uh, our blood vessels in our legs and our abdomen need to uh, contract. And so this works by increasing vascular resistance, sort of allowing the blood vessels to do that more easily. Um, some of the side effects of this one are a little bit odd. So pyloerection, that's like feeling like your, your hair uh, is standing on end. Um, and uh, other skin changes, kind of some itchiness or tingling can happen as well. Um, and both of these medications, the most kind of biggest side effect that we worry about is supine hypertension. So this is the blood pressure going high with lying down. So how do we avoid this? Well, I never give this medication late in the day. So this, these medicines are not safe to be taking with dinner. I often give them in the morning, sometimes midday or early afternoon, depending uh, on kind of how we're managing symptoms, but never later in the day. I also try to make sure that we're avoiding taking these medicines right before lying down. So for example, I'd often give one of these medicines with kind of say breakfast in the first dose of levodopa, but if people lie down for a nap after breakfast, that's not ideal. And really the blood pressure increasing medicine shouldn't be taken until people are gonna be up for several hours. Otherwise we run the risk of the blood pressure going quite high with lying down. Uh, so summary, I think we'll have lots of time for questions because I'm a little bit early, that's okay. Um, orthostatic hypotension or postural hypotension is very common in Parkinson's disease. We've heard a little bit why, you know, some of it is, is aging. This gets more common as we get older. Uh, some of it is the Parkinson's itself with the changes in our, our nervous system over time with the disease. And some of it is actually the medications that we're using for Parkinson's uh, can lead to these symptoms. If someone is asymptomatic and has a blood pressure drop, that doesn't necessarily need treatment. So even if I, I document a drop either in the clinic or someone has some records at home that show they're dropping, it's good for us to be more careful going forward. For example, I might warn that person uh, in particular that the blood pressure drop or symptoms may get worse if we're increasing something like the levodopa um, because I know they already have a little bit of, of blood pressure drop, um, but it doesn't necessarily need treatment. I think the key thing here is that the symptoms are not always obvious. So this, the symptoms aren't just sort of lightheadedness or dizziness on standing. Um, we talked about sort of headaches and blurred vision and, and foggy thinking and weakness and falls in particular. So um, we really need to make sure that we're, you know, if we document some blood pressure drop, that we are thorough in making sure there's no symptoms before deciding it doesn't need treatment. Bothersome symptoms, of course, we don't tend to treat non-bothersome symptoms in Parkinson's. Um, or if someone comes in and their complaint isn't blood pressure related, but let's say they're having falls or um, headaches or that kind of thing, I'm screening to make sure that that is not related uh, to blood pressure changes, because then treating this in, in various ways might be helpful for those symptoms that aren't obviously blood pressure related. 
So we've talked about modifications and kind of the movements that you do day to day. So moving a little bit slower, which isn't uh, isn't a struggle in Parkinson's usually, but changing positions more slowly, uh, you know, clenching some of the muscles, doing a bit of exercise before you get out of bed in the morning, changing habits such as increasing fluid, increasing salt, being cautious with hot weather, hot water, that kind of thing. Those changes for a lot of people might be enough to lessen their symptoms and we might not need to go further with other treatments. Um, we can figure out whether you have this by taking your own records if you have a blood pressure machine, uh, sitting and then after standing for one to three minutes. And then of course it's helpful to record those uh, and to be able to review them with your doctor to look at the actual change that's happening with position. Um, if you are having a blood pressure drop or if you're having symptoms that might relate to a blood pressure drop, this is a really important thing to review with your doctor. Many medications can lower your blood pressure. You might be on some because you needed them before. And it really, we need to review things to double check whether they're needed still. Um, treatment may include, you know, changing some of the other medications you're on, changing some of the medicines for, for other, that you're on for other reasons, being smart with how we're using our Parkinson's medication. And then in some people, if all of that has not been effective enough, uh, we might actually start another medication specifically that will work to try to lower the drop in blood pressure uh, to limit symptoms for people. So that's it, and I'd be very happy uh, to take any questions. So don't see any questions. I guess you were very clear <laughs> and informative. Um, we can give it another, oh, we have one, Teresa has raised her hand, um, just let me let her ask. Where is she? Uh, go ahead, Teresa. Thank you. It was hard to type all that. Um, my husband has Lewy body uh, and started and developed orthostatic hypotension. He started on Florinef and in most recently, well, for a number of years now, has on, been on Mitodrine, typically three times a day. Yeah. But yeah. now I have to take his blood pressure before we give it to him because his blood pressure can be extremely high or yeah. extremely yeah. low. Is that something you see very often or is that uncommon? It is actually. So the some of the changes that happen in the nervous system with Parkinson's, with more atypical forms like Lewy body or multiple systems atrophy, these changes over time can make the blood pressure more labile. Um, and so there can be issues with, with higher blood pressure mixed with, with lower blood pressure. Um, and so it, it is a common thing we see actually. Yeah. So by making sure that I'm I'm testing before I give it to him, and I I don't yeah. usually give it to him if it's over 130. Yeah. Um, so kind of working with your doctor to get a good target for that, um, yeah. and every once in a while, sort of still, if possible, doing those vitals in different positions. So you know, if you know that it's 130 sitting, but it, it drops to 100 every time someone stands up, we might be a little bit more generous with kind of our, our target while sitting. Um, but it, it's a good thing to review with your doctor. And I certainly, for, especially for people who've been on these medications long term, we do commonly kind of be a bit more careful with the blood pressure readings. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a comment about the need for salt. Uh, I know this is surprising because most of us have been told for decades to avoid salt. Um, and there are some people with high blood pressure that have kind of salt responsive blood pressure. You know, their blood pressure go up, goes up uh, too high if, if they have too much salt. 
most of the times when I talk about this in the clinic, this is the first people, time people have ever heard uh, to increase their salt intake, um, but it can be quite helpful if you're having symptoms uh, with, with dropping of the blood pressure. Um, uh, so another question, is it possible that the use of CBD to assist with insomnia with Parkinson's can uh, lower the blood pressure? Yes, it definitely can. So um, you're right, I, I didn't actually mention that, but one of the uh, side effects of, of CBD can be uh, the blood pressure dropping. I think it, um, it depends on when you're having the symptoms. So if you're using blood CBD to assist with insomnia, sort of talking with your doctor for other recommendations, there might be other safer medicines with, with or supplements with lower side effects to help with insomnia. I wouldn't expect, you know, there's not going to be a lot of changes in blood pressure the next day at lunch if if you're taking it at bedtime um, but it can lead to issues with sort of blood pressure dropping overnight so any of the the strategies we talked about that are sort of non-medication based fluid salts uh you know moving more closely uh slowly uh would all potentially help with with that side effect Um, so a patient, uh, recommendation it, yeah. So I think, you know, it's, it's, some of this might be, um, hard to understand. I think people with Parkinson's have sort of different abilities to understand this information. As we mentioned earlier, this is recorded. So it is something you can go over, kind of look at the slides more slowly. That might be, uh, helpful as well. Um, Certainly the, the increase in salt, uh, not a blanket statement for everyone with Parkinson's, but for people who are struggling with, with blood pressure drop, uh, which we know is quite common. Um, a question about whether THC taken with CBD would help with the blood pressure. I think we're getting a little bit into the hinterlands here. There are lots of sort of cautions I would have for using marijuana products in Parkinson's for a variety of reasons. Um, the, you know, I don't love starting other drugs to treat side effects unless those drugs are really required, right? So for Parkinson's medication, um, you know, we need to use those. Whereas if people are having bad side effects from CBD, the answer is probably to go off it. Um, uh, coat hanger pain. So a question about coat hanger pain. Yeah, so pain, I don't think actually that was in my list of symptoms. Some people can get uh, pain through the kind of back and, and upper shoulders there as a, a symptom of uh, a blood pressure drop of orthostatic hypotension. It's again related to, to decreased blood flow. Um, and that can be an unexpected symptom that's indicative of having a blood pressure drop. Um, ideally, kind of these symptoms would also be helped if they're happening with, with stand, there can be other reasons obviously for, for back and shoulder pain, but if it's happening just with changing position, um, then uh, some of these other strategies may be helpful to manage that symptom as well. Uh, there's a question about this being recorded and, and how it will be accessible. I believe the whole thing is being recorded and will be on the Parkinson's BC uh, website. Uh, please, someone uh, correct me if I'm wrong with that. Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, it usually takes, well, we usually say within a week it will be posted. Uh, we do have two other uh, questions from attendees who have raised their hand. So we have one from Elis oh sorry from Karen yeah go ahead Karen oh uh, yes I wondered what the relationship is with DBS and orthostatic hypotension I don't know that it's totally understood and it depends on the DBS target 
the, ev the literature is a little bit mixed when they've tried to look at this in the research. So some people who have a particular target with DBS STN, they might have less uh, blood pressure drop compared to before they got the DBS. Okay, thank you. Um, and Elizabeth, you had your hand up earlier. I don't know if you still had the question. I don't see it up now, but if you do, I'm allowing you to speak. I've unmuted. Yeah, I was trying to type it instead. Um, I was one, wondering if there's an alternative to amantadine for dyskinesias, contributing to my low blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, not usually. It, so sometimes dyskinesias can be helped by um, changing the levodopa, kind of working with your doctor to change the levodopa dose or the timing, depending on kind of the type of dyskinesia that people are having. But in terms of other targeted treatments uh, for dyskinesias, unfortunately not at this time. Oftentimes, if we need the amantadine to treat the dyskinesias, it's kind of in the same category as needing the levodopa to treat the Parkinson's. And so often we're, we're using other strategies to help with the blood pressure because those, those meds can be really necessary for people. Thank you. Okay, so I don't see any Karen's other. Karen's hand is up. I'm not sure if it went down and back up or not. Oh, does she have another question? I'm not. No, sure. I think it went down. It just took some time. Oh, yeah, it's down now. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I think. Perhaps we can wrap up this talk then. Did you want to give it another minute or? Um, yeah, I think we're, I think we've reached the end. 